Hello everyone, welcome to the ATAR Notes July lecture series, as well as our lecture for English Units 3 and 4. My name is Sunny, I'm really excited to be delivering this lecture to you all today, and I hope that you find it really helpful in preparation for exams. So on these slides you can ju just see some resources that ATAR Notes has to offer, so feel free to take a look. Um, but let's jump right into the lecture. So I want to start off by introducing myself. As I mentioned, my name is Sunny. Um, I completed uh, VC in 2021 with an ATAR of 96.70. Uh, I received a study score of 44 in English, um, but I also completed three English subjects. So I did literature and English language as well, um, on top of my other subjects, which included legal studies, further maths and psychology. And I'm currently in my last year of completing a Bachelor of Paramedicine degree at Monash University. So let's reposition and take a look at the layout of Unit 3 and Unit 4 for you guys in English, as well as what's going to be on your exam. So a lot of what you study is also your part of one of your free exam tasks. So you do two checks response uh, essays, one in unit three, one in unit four. One of those text response essays, you know, you can choose which text you want it to be on. You can actually decide, but you will also have a text response essay as your section A on the exam. Creating text, you do in unit three. So you need to be constantly revising this because this is the new section B of the exam. In unit four, you also do analyzing argument and presenting argument, which is your oral. And these are two both very closely interrelated tasks. Um, but ultimately, you have an analyzing argument essay that you have to do as section C of your exam as well. So it's really important you study for all three types of essays throughout the year. I recommend doing an essay, especially at this time of the year, really doing an essay every single week. Um, and, you know, mixing up based on which exam section. So one week I might do a text response, another week I might do an analyzing argument essay, or if I'm particularly weak in any one of these three, I spend a bit more time and I write maybe even a couple essays every week to feedback and keep improving and figure out uh, what, what could be changed and what could improve. So actively work on all three sections, always at this stage of the year, under time conditions. So on the exam, you have 60 minutes per per written response. So give your, giving yourself that maximum of 60 minutes to handwrite, and then um, you must complete it during that time. Mark yourself, feedback yourself. You can use past examiner's reports to see feedback points as well about what students do well and do not well and what to get for a high scoring response. Um, and you know, practice rewriting essays as well uh, based on the feedback that you get from your teacher or, you know, from self-marking to really ensure that improvement. Because you can write a lot, but if you don't feedback uh, yourself and work on your areas of weakness, nothing will really improve. So this is very, very important. Um, amazing. So today we're looking at a lot of things. The first part is presenting argument. You know, you can also follow along on this bottom bar here and see exactly where we're up to. So we'll look at our oral task first, then argument analysis. And there's a bigger section on this this time than previous lecture, previous lectures because it's part of your unit four. Um, so we'll, we'll be spending quite a bit of time on argument analysis. There's a the little section on audiovisual argument analysis as well, which has been added to the study design. And then text response and creating text, we'll be doing um, a bit of a revision on that as well. So throughout the live broadcast of this lecture, you have the live chat Q&A on the same page that you're watching from. And I will be present during the session time, so during those two hours throughout. Um, so this is your time to ask any questions about any of the areas of studying English or, you know, study tips and tricks, anything like that. Um, as I will be answering all of you guys' questions live. So make use of that opportunity. Um, and under resources on the same page, you are also able to download, download um, the lesson slides uh, as well. So let's have a chat about presenting argument. Um, your oral, um, and the aim is to use persuasive language techniques 
persuade your audience of your contention and back this up with sub arguments. So the requirement of this task is that you choose a recent issue that has been in Australian media uh, in this past year. <clears throat> so must be a relevant, current, meaningful issue that you choose. And just like the argument analysis articles that you study, you're basically writing your own persuasive piece to deliver in an oral manner. So making sure it is engaging when you present it verbally, you're making use of body language, any props, maybe like a PowerPoint presentation or something to go with it. Um, and also planning your vocal effects, such as your pauses, intonations, changes in tone, um, stress, all of those things as well to get those high, high, high marks. Um, now the time limit generally varies depending on your school, but uh, in, in, you know the time limit may limit how uh, much detail you can go into when giving a specific argument, but ultimately you must have three arguments for this task as well as a counter argument. So generally your first argument within your oral will be about introducing the issue and the sort of the main reason of why you are for or against that issue. Then you have your second argument. And for your counter argument, uh, for your third argument, you should have a counter argument as well as a rebuttal. Okay, so some people also disagree with me and some stakeholders think this about an issue and they have the opposite point of view to me. But then this is also wrong and here's why. That's basically what a rebuttal should look like, okay? It's basically like reverse engineering, analyzing argument, because it's exactly, um, instead of analyzing a persuasive piece, now your aim is to write one and present it. Don't inform, persuade. So nothing is worse than an unengaging oral that has too much of a logical tone to it, um, that has is littered with all of these statistics and evidence and quotes forming the backbone of the whole oral presentation. What students score well are the students that create an engaging piece. So making use of humor, making use of a persona, making use of emotive language, adding lots of engaging um, appeals to different groups, using anecdotal evidence. All of these things are the things that will make you stand out. And the things that I notice about pieces that don't do so well is you know, they might be littered with rhetorical questions or an abundance of evidence rather than um, being engaging. And, and listeners will become disengaged and your assessor will become disengaged too. Um, your aim overall is to tell your audience what you think, feel, believe, and make them think, feel, believe it too. So the aim is to be convincing and you, you having lots of PLTs to ensure this. <clears throat> So it's your unit four SAC and the way it's split basically is you get 75% marks from the actual presentation from the oral itself. And then you get 25% of marks from your statement of intention or your written explanation, which is very, very similar to creating text. The written explanation you write there, it's basically the same thing, except now when you're analyzing your deliberate language choices, you should be analyzing your PLTs, your persuasive language techniques and applying the what, how, why process of analysis. We'll revise that again today. But basically that's your intended effect with regards to your audience of these PLTs, as well as how does the language or the PLTs you've used help to make your argument or contention more convincing overall and enhance it. So that's uh, different because your analysis in the statement of intention for creating text was more like a text response. But this statement of intention is more like an argument analysis essay that is informal, written in first person, where you're completing the what, how, why process of analysis on yourself. Time restrictions vary, generally five to six uh, minutes. So you do need to time yourself when you have your final draft and how long it takes you to deliver. Being mindful that <clears throat> delivering an oral too slowly or speaking too quickly are also really unengaging things. So if you have an oral that's way over time, be sure to cut down rather than to try to make it work by talking very quickly. 
and the requirement that I mentioned, the issue you choose must have appeared in the Australian media since September 2023, so the start of uh, <clears throat> Uh, basically, one one up to one year before your start of exam period. Um, importantly, you should always start with research. So don't choose an issue that is not meaningful, that is not relevant. Don't choose an issue you are not personally interested in and engaged with. So if you're struggling, start watching the news, read tabloids and um. <clears throat> pages that have a lot of articles and I've just attached some that are great to look into and the first research you should be doing is to choose your issue and then of course you should be accumulating evidence and finding articles with regards to the topic that you've chosen to find both arguments for and against any evidence any quotes and any PLTs that you would like to use yourself as well in your piece and all of that should be done before writing and you should probably spend more time on this than actually writing up your piece because once you've done all the research and planning you know you've got your contention your free arguments and the evidence underneath and dot points that you want to use um you will immediately be ready to start writing from there students find it really hard to start worlds and really hard to keep them going and you know, keep writing them and finish them um and a lot of the time the reason for that is inadequate research and planning so make sure you're all across this your speech also has to be delivered, not read, so structure really, really matters. And this is sort of the layout of the overall structure and what it should look like. There should be a little bit of an introduction first about your issue, and be sure to start that with a hook. So start that with some kind of persuasive language technique from the get-go to hook your audience in and make them interested from the get-go. A lot of students like to start with something like, a rhetorical question or an interesting fact or a statement from the very beginning before they start establishing the context. Remember, context, audience, um, and persona are also what you receive marks for on this task. So you must create some context to your piece. Is it, you know, just like post COVID-19? Is it, um, is the context relating to some kind of war tension somewhere or crisis? Um, is it relating to inflation in today's society? So establish a clear context when you're providing that introduction as well, because you get marks for that as well. You must be using language that clearly targets a specific audience as well. So think about what kind of language you would use and what kind of PLTs and appeals you would use to appeal to different audiences and incorporate that throughout your piece. And if you're also using a persona rather than just presenting as a student, make sure to establish that early on in your introduction. <clears throat> in your introduction, your point of view for or against should be made really clear as well, <clears throat> as well as your main reason behind that opinion, your main reason for being for or against the issue. And what do you want your audience to do or feel? What is the main thing that you're trying to get them out of it? Raise awareness, some kind of call to action, perhaps, whatever that may be. And then your free arguments, um, your, your free arguments really should be including your counter argument and the rebuttal to that. So I said before that you shouldn't spend too long on this counter argument, right? you should spend much longer on your actual rebuttal. So this is a good way to view it. Some might argue and present that stakeholder opinion. Why do people have the opposite opinion to yours? Give that one reason and then refute it. Um, however, this is incorrect because, and then you start, your, most of your third argument is relating to your rebuttal. And it's um, not about the counter argument, okay? You shouldn't spend heaps of time on this counter argument because that is not your main position. So if you do, that's gonna create an inconsistency in your oral. In your conclusion, try to summarize, end with a bang, make some kind of call to action, make some kind of you know, strong appeal and come up with a really engaging way to end. So a plan to a speech could look something like this. I stress the importance of planning before you actually write. So obviously this is, not a current issue, but this is a really good example. If you think about current issues, 
again, I told you about some pages you can go to, but, uh, or watching the news, there are lots of current issues. I think some engaging ones are the cost of living and housing prices, um, artificial intelligence, chat GPT, um, war tensions and, and current wars is a bit too controversial. I would actually abstain from it. Um, crime rates increasing, risk of international spread of disease and fear, fears of emerging diseases. There's lots of different topics ongoing where you just choose something you're engaged with. Um, so this is what a plan could look like. For instance, my contention is that the Australian government must implement a sugar tax. So I have a perspective for the issue. My argument one, I wanted to introduce that current health measures such as the health star rating, the voluntary codes of conduct and marketing are inadequate to reduce sugar consumption. For my second argument, I will go into the fact that taxation revenue can be used on recreational and health related infrastructure such as hospitals, which could create more jobs. So the sugar tax would have um, an economic benefit to it. And then for my rebuttal, I might go into the fact that some argue that taxing sugar will have detrimental impacts on the sugar industry, but that this will encourage companies to create healthier food products. So you can clearly see both my counter argument and my rebuttal there. I would also add my evidence and a little dot point plan as to how I'm going to approach each and every single one of the arguments and how they're going to structure chronologically before I write them as well. Okay, now talking about some techniques. So starting with a hook, we said starting with a hook means starting with some kind of persuasive language technique. So let's have a look at this one. Consider this, an Australian Muslim woman of two is deeply in love with the Victorian town her family feels lucky to call home. But after she clicks on a Facebook page titled Stop the Mosque in Bendigo and is met with a torrent of anti-Islamic rhetoric, and even personal threats, she begins to question the community she thought had embraced her family. So this is a great hook to start with. So consider this, that phrase is a cliche. It's a generalized saying. Be careful with them because if you don't do them effectively, they can diminish the quality of your piece. But in this case, this was effective. And also the fact that we started with an example. This is not anecdotal evidence because it's not about the author themselves, but an example, storytelling, right? And there's lots of also imagery embedded within this start okay so that's a great hook having a look at another one african americans line the streets of their communities with their hands up as they beg cops not to shoot as the movement started in the wake of trayvon martin's death still echoes in their hearts still pleading for their right to safety and protection reminding us that their lives matter that black lives matter so What's engaging about this hook, we see the repetition, reminding that their lives matter, that black lives matter. Engaging repetition, made a use of short sentence structure to add an emphasis as well. We don't wanna see long convoluted sentences in an oral too often because that's very disengaging as well. And then of course, this violent imagery with negative connotations. They beg cops not to shoot. <clears throat> still echoes in their hearts that's really emotive language so this makes for a great hook as well another one in sweeping the world are the voices joining together in a mighty chorus that is finally saying time's up that the ages of men like harvey weinstein hiding behind their fame are long gone that the world must be a better place for hashtag me too again imagery emotive language has been used sweeping the world and then um, <clears throat> repetition, that the ages, that the world creates that engaging start. There's another one here that you can have a look at and read. But I think everyone, everyone should get the idea. Um, so what are some of the requirements of this task and in general to create that effective, engaging speech? <laughs> you must be using a range of PLTs embedded throughout. So this is what you have to analyze in your statement of intention as well is your deliberate choices so make sure you plan to make sure your oral has enough plts really they should be all over the place otherwise your piece isn't really persuasive so if you struggle with that do heaps of planning before you start writing about what kind of ones you want to embed and how many you want to be there for each argument <clears throat> you need to be able to show how you can use language to persuade 
and try to make your PLTs easily identifiable. <coughs> but if they're not so easily identifiable, you know, you've got that statement of intention accompanying your piece and you're able to detail some of your intent and, and what you've used. So this is an example here of how to make them easily identifiable. This is supported by the professor of the Institute for Religion, Politics and Society at ANU, Irfan Ahmad, who noted that with the rise of ISIS claimed violence, Muslims in our community and around the world are slowly losing their individualism. So we can clearly see that this is expert evidence. How? Because it's been properly credited, the person has also been named and context has been provided for the example. And it flows smoothly. It's smoothly embedded into the sentence. It's not say, standing as some kind of quote where you say, Irfan Ahmad says, quote, end sentence. Okay? And we can see that highlighted there. This is supported by, same when you use a statistic, you can, you can say something like research from institution suggests that. <clears throat> Beautiful. Now, importantly to consider is your actual delivery. As per the VCAR rubric, your delivery is actually worth 20% of your oral marks, or it should be. Hopefully your school's rubric is in line with that VCAR rubric. Um, but that's a whole quarter of your marks. That's a lot. So your delivery really, really matters. You could have an amazing oral and lose a whole quarter of your marks for your delivery not being planned. Additionally, um, <clears throat> You, when your delivery is poor, it takes away from the quality of your actual oral. Because remember, it's being spoken when you're delivering it. So if you rushed it, your assessor could even miss that you had great, amazing ideas in there. And your arguments were really interesting because your delivery was poor. So it might actually affect more than that percentage of your marks. Really important to understand. Practice in front of a mirror, practice in front of your friends, in front of your family. But overall, these are the things you should consider. <laughs> body language, have open body language. So that means not being closed off, but, you know, maintaining a good posture, looking confident, not holding those cue cards to your chest and like looking down. You know, you can hold it in front of you, with your arms more wide open. Use gestures, make use of hand gestures, have eye contact all around the room. If that intimidates you, you know, you can look kind of above people's heads and it will look like you're making that eye contact use the space and cue cards away from body for your voice take pauses when you're starting don't even speak straight away as well wait for everyone to be paying attention to you speak slowly change your tone project be loud don't be quiet um and make use of silences extended pauses etc so actually when you've got your cue cards for your oral make annotations of the vocal techniques that you're planning so write down where you want to pause write down where you want to place stress or emphasis unless this is something that comes to you really easy and like automatically you should plan it out for your cue cards don't handwrite them print them in a large font with big spacing in between for your annotations and if you would like to highlight anything um, such as a part you generally forget and get stuck when you look down and you can't find it, you can bold it or underline it. You shouldn't have to memorize your speech word for word, but be very familiar with it and practice it a lot. Um, if you get lost and you have to pause because you were just reading the whole thing and you're missing where the next part is that you have to read, that's going to really um, negatively impact your delivery. Um, so you should practice it to the point that you can remember a lot of the parts of your oral and you don't have to look down for all of them and read them. Extra tips is that something that makes an oral really, really engaging. And I love to see is when students actually pick, um, a specific target audience and a persona for their oral. I said that you get marks for this as well. So be really mindful that if your audience is the general public and your persona is you, you're not likely to get full marks if that was what you're aiming for. Um, so an example, let's say your oral was about Australian media law. So of course you wanna choose a relevant stakeholder, a relevant persona, and you decided on a small news journalist. 
and then your target audience is big news journalists who call for the law to be passed. So that shows a really relevant persona and a really relevant audience that will make this much more interesting. <clears throat> Similarly, if you did vaccine hesitancy, your persona could be an ICU nurse, and then you're targeting <clears throat> older Australians that don't want to take uh, the vaccine to explain to them why it's really important. <clears throat> Additional tips, clearly signposting your speech, make it clear when you're moving on to the next argument. In general, every single time you're moving on to the next argument, you should really have a pause and lower your intonation when you're getting to the end of the idea before you start the next one to clearly indicate that the next thing that you're going to say is going to be the next argument. And it's okay to use some signposts as long as you don't overuse it. You know, you can say things like furthermore, additionally, just like you would in an essay. And you could use bookending in, instead of a hook. This is where you start with an idea and it's like your first sentence or first thing you bring up in your oral but then you close you finish your oral with an extension of that idea so that could be for instance you you tell one half of a story and you don't finish it your whole oral goes on and as part of your conclusion and your closing you finish that story and provide a sort of summary of why it's important so that's just an alternative to a hook if you really struggle to start and finish an oral and you can't think of a way to make it engaging. Now your statement of intention for your oral, again, really similar to creating text. And um, obviously we looked at this Flapsy um, format for the first paragraph when we looked at um, creating text in April's lecture. Um, so hopefully you're familiar, but if not, it's very clearly um, laid out if you didn't attend that. So your first paragraph should cover, cover all of your big ideas with regards to your oral that are on your statement of intention rubric. So you're, you start with form. So for instance, I have chosen to write a persuasive speech titled the title of your oral about what your issue is about. <clears throat> then you go into language and you mention some of your main language choices. So you identify what persona you took on and why so do, were you a student were you um an office worker a parent whatever it was you should also identify your register and why you chose that register um and you should also identify the main tone of your piece just like you do in an argument analysis essay and explain for what effect you wanted to use that tone or why you chose that tone as well then go to your audience define your intended audience and you know you can either talk about have a quick sentence about how you use language to target that audience specifically what kind of maybe appeals you use for instance to appeal to that audience specifically or why you chose that intended audience specifically then your purpose which is your message or your ultimate takeaway should be defined <clears throat> which should be um you know to raise awareness, to propose some kind of solution, to do some kind of call to action, but make that really very specific, okay? Um, and then context, the issue should be placed in the context. We said there's marks for this as well. I'm not saying that should go last. That can be introduced together with form in this first big paragraph, or that can just be littered and be clear through, made clear throughout your statement of intention. Then, the next bit of, of, of writing that you should have is all of your deliberate choices. So you've selected the most relevant and the most interesting PLTs from throughout your oral and you analyze, you complete the what, how, why process of analysis for them. So maybe consider up to five persuasive language techniques is what I would analyze, maybe about four or five for this to be a complete statement of intention. Um, and, you know, that can be analyzing just that analyzing argument component, just you're completing on your own speech. I like to put each deliberate choice in a separate paragraph. So I just have mini paragraphs. There's a little mini paragraph for each technique. You could conflate it all into one paragraph, um, but it's just a little bit harder to structure that way. So we've got an example here. Um, let's go through it and see how that structure has been applied. On the topic of Australia's obesity epidemic, I've decided to address the issue of whether or not overly sugarly drinks should be taxed in Australia. 
So we can see that this is providing the background and the context and is leading into form, which is that first component. And now that the form is fully explained, in my speech to the Australian Senate, as Richard D. Natal, so the persona is being introduced here, the leader of Australian Greens, I urgently and passionately contend that taxing sugar is an essential change that needs to be made to combat obesity in Australia. So we can see it's continuing on with language. What else did we need? The degree of formality and the main tone. So the tone is being introduced here, as well as the contention in terms of those main language choices. I chose to adopt the persona of Richard Natal as he's a passionate advocate for a tax on sugar in Australia, explaining why that persona was chosen. Being a former general practitioner, he's very knowledgeable in regards to issues involving public health and enthusiastically advocates for improvements in legislations regarding the health of Australians. Probably a bit too much detail than is needed here. <clears throat> uh, I would stop at just a sentence each for tone, persona, and um, <clears throat> Uh, degree of formality and why that degree of formality was chosen. As the speech is being presented in the Australian Senate, so that's the context being established, I have used a formal register and the relevant conventions of a speech presented in the, in the Senate, such as thanking the acting deputy president at the beginning. So it's not just defining why the formal register was chosen, but also how it was established in the piece. To project in Natal's bold opinion supporting taxation of sugar in Australia, I've used an urgent but measured tone. So tone is defined as well. Now we see the purpose and the audience as well. The purpose is to convince my audience to support the taxation of sugar in Australia with hopes to pass a bill that taxes overly sugarly products by 20%. So we see the call to action and it's nice and specific. And then the audience has been provided it's defining them as specifically members of the Australian Senate and talking about why they have been targeted. Amazing. So on this list, just some presentation strategies. These are some specific PLTs that you might consider putting in your oral. If any of these look unfamiliar, obviously you have argument analysis this year too, so you should be familiar with all of them, but do a little bit of research if if you don't know some of these, you, sh you should be adept in understanding what all of this is. Um, but if you're struggling to find things to discuss in your statement of intention, it's going to mean that you didn't have enough PLTs in your speech. So make sure to plan some PLTs you're specifically going to put in your oral before you even start writing. Okay, on to part two, which is our argument analysis section. So going through the criteria for your argument analysis task and what you're going to be marked on. First of all, your comprehension of material and contention. So the very first hurdle of this task is understanding what the author thinks, feels, believes and wants to happen. Okay, so you need to be able to craft accurate and relevant topic sentences as well as, well as a contention that goes in your introduction. Then your quality of analysis, which is the bulk of your marks. For argument analysis, it is really quite relevant to do dot point essays where you're just completing um, annotations over the article and then you're completing the what, how, why process, just analyzing a bunch of PLTs. We'll look at the feel, think, do method as well. We'll look at both. However, you're also expected to be specific with your analysis. So full completion of the what, how, why process means you quote the PLT, you name it and tell us exactly what it is um, and you tell us what that example does. So there must be an actual explanation of that PLT or language choice before you move on to analyze either the intended effect or the why, which is how it contributes to the argument and makes it more convincing. And then of course, your expression and vocabulary. Meta language is very important in this area of study. So that means not saying, the intended effect of this is, the intended effect of this is. No, the offer aims to incite feelings of, evokes, provokes, you know, have a big vocabulary of words, have a big vocabulary of different words for tone, whether it's categorized into positive, negative, and neutral tones. And of course, being able to name each and every single persuasive language technique. <clears throat> and just the flow 
um, of your writing. Don't try to sound fancy. <laughs> Being clear is much more important than sounding sophisticated if you're not able to. Okay, if that there's a difference of if 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 you're good and or if you're not so good at sounding sophisticated, if if you struggle with that, don't force yourself to do it. Prioritize being clear. So here are our analysis strategies and how we can actually analyze. So one of those is the what, how, why method. So this is a three-step method. The what has to be completed for every PLT, every persuasive language technique. And then you have the option of analyzing either the how or the why or both. So when you want to do an extended analysis, such as you found this appeal to patriotism and it's super significant, you might complete all three steps and have an extended analysis, but you should do that sparingly. So the, in the what process, we're defining what is the offer doing and what language and techniques are used. This is where you have to quote and use meta language to name the technique. And then you need to actually explain it before you can analyze it. So moving on to the next step. Don't forget this part. Students miss that explanation part a lot of the time. And then it is not clear how does this technique possibly lead to this intended effect if you haven't explained it. Um, <clears throat> so making sure we don't forget to do that. Then the how is the intended effect. So what does the author want readers to feel or think or do? Always mention specific audience groups. Don't just say the author wants their audience to think or feel or do this, okay? Um, you actually use the audience names because that's actually um, a specific feedback point that comes up and comes up on the examiner's reports. Students not being able to identify audience. And then the why step, which is where you would analyze why does the author want them to think or feel or believe something? And why is this language persuasive? How does it contribute to the contention, to the argument, to make it more convincing? Be very specific here as well. So, you know, do that extended analysis, maybe a couple of times per body paragraph where you complete all three. Otherwise, <coughs> just pick what's more relevant for a PLT. Is it the intended effect or the why that is more relevant to analyze? And overall, um, you can aim for maybe four PLTs per body paragraph as a sufficient number to write about. <clears throat> now, the feel, think, do method is an alternative method. So <clears throat> where you analyze either the feel, the think, or the do um, to the intended audience. <clears throat> so the first step is the same. Quote the PLT and name it and explain it, and then choose one of these three or multiple to analyze. So either what emotion does the author want the audience to feel, what does the offer want the audience to think or what does the offer want the audience to do and there's a bit of vocabulary here written down for you guys so if you like this method here's an example by employing a tricolon crescendo that australia could become a happy thriving multicultural democracy morrison positions immigrant australians to feel embraced short and succinct nice quote they're less likely <coughs> to believe that morrison is respectful which is the think, and therefore place more trust in him as an authority figure, which is an analysis of the do. I believe this method doesn't work for a lot of PLTs and evidence. This is something you might use as an additional strategy on top of the what, how, why, but I believe this is method is what all students should be sticking to. Okay. <clears throat> now, how to enhance your marks? It's not just through the quality of your analysis and doing heaps of it and getting better and better at it, but it's also about being selective with your PLTs for each body paragraph and each argument. So don't just look for the obvious PLTs, like rhetorical questions, statistical evidence, expert opinion, anecdotes. Find the subtle ones as well. Discuss connotations. <coughs> discuss appeals discuss sarcasm, irony, humor um, to get those high marks. Obviously, though, it should be a balance. So sometimes those simple PLTs, a lot of the time, those simple PLTs are very, very important too. So I would try to have the simple ones that are essential to the argument and that I can have a strong analysis for. And then the other half, I would make sure in my body paragraph are subtle PLTs that are being analyzed. 
look at the structure of the sentence or paragraph, use of specific words, etc. Go above just, you know, the textbook, um, the textbook ones, look for things like metaphors, you know, symbols, alliteration, anything else that sticks out and could be relevant. Um, <clears throat> don't forget tone and tonal shifts. Tonal shift is an expectation that you find and analyze on the exam if you want to get high marks. And there usually will be one or two sustained tonal shifts in an argument analysis article that you should find, name, and analyze. <clears throat> as well as connotative analysis is an expectation. And just like with, to with tone, where you are not permitted to say the tone has shifted from X tone to Y tone, you need to do that properly. You need to quote to what the tone has shifted to as well. You don't just identify from what tone to what kind of tone it's shifted, but you, you need to find some descriptive or emotive language to quote with that to sh indicate the tonal shift. Same thing with connotations. It's not enough to, to say and end at positive connotations or negative connotations. You need to go beyond that. So the positive connotations contained in quote are associated with, and then you need to provide, you know, if you're saying negative, so what, what connotations, what imagery does it raise in someone's mind when they're reading the article with that quote or that piece of information? Um, so when you say something is positive or negative connotations, you actually need to describe what kind of connotations it, it incites in someone's mind as they read that. Um, so looking at an example of here of trying to find subtle PLTs, the darling is suffering from record low flows, fish deaths, and algal blooms. So a mid scoring student might just say, say that there's a listing here for those low flows, fish deaths, and algal blooms. That's quite relevant too, but let's make it more complex. There's jargon of low flows and algal blooms, but there's also imagery. And even more importantly, there's connotations attached to suffering, those negative connotations. And there's also personification. They're making the darling, which is just a body of water, sound like it's alive because it's suffering. So those would be more valuable to analyze than just that listing we spotted at the beginning. Okay, so now we actually apply our process of analysis. Looking at a letter to the editor, we will try to complete the, the what, how, why uh, process of analysis. Okay. So let's read it together first. This is about COVID, but it's still like highly relevant. This example is, is itself is very, very good. So letter to the editor, stop the fear mongering so we can build confidence. I'm 53 and like many people hesitated about getting the jab because the risks seem to outweigh the benefits in a COVID free community. Like many, when the latest outbreak occurred in Victoria, I had my doctor talk sense into me and got myself in for my first vaccination. There was a lot of information, but I trusted the advice we were being given. I'm 11 days post jab and I'm still staying vigilant for any side effects. Now I read that the threshold has moved and those under 60 are advised to ask for the Pfizer vaccine. What is someone like me supposed to feel? In this whole process, I feel as though we know too little, too much. We need to stop fear mongering and build confidence if we are to have any hope of achieving herd immunity. And then the person signed off, signed off there. So a great planning or practice task you could do, obviously I'd recommend doing this with a bigger article, was just to complete the what, how, why process uh, of analysis on an article based on dot points. So kind of writing a dot point essay. But we will look at this being applied um, for a few different PLTs, just so you can have a revision of exactly how you do the process of analysis. So this has the field thing do here. So this is more focusing around intended effect, but it's really similar to the process of analysis we do for the what, how, why. So you can modify that. <clears throat> so number one, we'll take the personal anecdote, or you could also say that's where she's trying to build rapport. Uh, I'm 53, like many people hesitated about getting the jab. The audience, for this statement is older Australians who are currently skeptical about getting the AstraZeneca vaccine. How does that make them feel? By creating a personal anecdote and talking about herself and how she fits into the issue, she's 
allowing the audience to feel more heard, validated, and understood in a sense of companionship. That's what that word means um, with with the audience that might be in a in a similar boat. She also aims to make them think. This is kind of like the why process of analysis. This component think that vaccine hesitancy is quite widespread in the Australian community and they're not alone in feeling this way. It's okay to doubt it, it's okay to second guess it and feel worried. <clears throat> what does she make them want to do to instill more trust in herself as someone who understands people's stance? So you can see the benefit of doing a really extended analysis like this because you will have so many ideas and you'll practice becoming a quick thinker in argument analysis and also, if you have so many ideas, students, that's exactly what students struggle with a lot of the time. The students are not creative enough in their argument analysis essays. And I often see with my students as well, they'll have this really significant amount of repetition of the same ideas in their essay and struggle to come up with anything new to say or valuable ideas. So practice doing detailed dot point analyses like this. It not also it also helps to mitigate that and fix that issue, but it also helps you to practice being selective. So if I apply the whole process of analysis, which one of these ideas is the best and the one that I want to put in my essay? Well, probably the think for this one, as well as the fact that she aims to instill more trust is the ones that I would mention. Looking at another example, rhetorical question, what is someone like me supposed to feel? <clears throat> Again, definitely targeting older Australians. Um, people that also thought it was safe to take the AstraZeneca vaccine and there wouldn't be any side effects. And how is that going to make them feel? Well, betrayed, skeptical and doubtful of their decisions and especially the government. It's going to make them think that their vaccine hesitancy is justified because there is constant fluxes or changes in health advice that the government provides. And it's going to, in terms of what it makes them do, well, it makes them stop blaming themselves or their doctors for their vaccine hesitancy and instead feel as though they should blame the government. And here we see an ellipsis, so that's where we see that triple dot. And also a juxtaposition. In this whole process, I feel as though we know too little, too much. So the contradicting statement, the juxtaposition is in too little, too much. This one is super implicit. This is definitely a subtle PLT that I would try, try to analyze for a high scoring response if I was writing an argument analysis like body paragraph on this letter to the editor. <clears throat> the audience here is different. It's actually the politicians who are responsible for delivering public health advice. <clears throat> She's trying to make them feel ashamed, ashamed and guilty because they spread all of this misinformation about the vaccine being safe and then they change that information trying to make them think that they've caused immense distress, which is emphasized by the ellipses. That would be a pause if this was being delivered um, verbally um, to the Australian public by constantly changing the health advice. <clears throat> and it's trying to make them, in terms of do, reflect on the impact that their fickle public communication has actually had on Australians and the harm it has caused. <clears throat> Amazing. So. Hopefully that gives a great example for everyone. We're also going to take a look at that introduction structure and visual analysis as well. So your intro should include, I like this, this is a helpful abbreviation because there is quite a lot that needs to be in your intro. So you use this abbreviation, it's a fact. You start by introducing the issue. In recent times, blah, blah, blah has been happening. Then the title source, offer, and form. So the I like to just group all of these four under what I call publication details. Then the audience of the piece, the contention and the tone. The contention statement should just include the tone and the audience as well. And this is a great way to cut down. Okay, now let's have a look at visual analysis. Remember visual analysis must be done. Any visual that is in your article, all of them should be analyzed. And your mission is to find which argument or which body paragraph the visual belongs to and should be analyzed under. Okay. Visual analysis, just like your regular PLTs, goes in the same paragraph, but it needs to be introduced. So, for instance, I'm writing a body paragraph and I'm finding an appropriate place in that body paragraph to link to my visual. So then I say, 
this is accompanied by a photograph of a young woman crowd surfacing at a music festival supporting the offer's assertion of the danger and recklessness of youth. But you don't stop there. After just describing your visual, just like with your regular PLTs, you need to find one to two things for, from the visual to analyze, to ap apply the what, how, why process of analysis for, uh, to. So that could be anything from color, size, scale, a symbol, a bit of text, a background, element, a foreground element, or a central object. She's obviously the central object in this visual. Um, any of those things, okay? And, and more. Similarly, you'll use meta-language, although these are very easy words. So, we said do not ever analyze an image in a standalone paragraph. So what to do and what not to do. So this is the good example. The first sentence I already read, this is the same. This assertion of teen recklessness is bolstered by the prominent photograph showing a young woman crowd surfacing at a music festival. Please note that you need to state the visual type. So this is a photograph in this case, but it could be a drawing, a comic, a caricature, a cartoon, anything. So it needs to be named as well. And then you describe <clears throat> what can you see in the visual overall. On to the next part, which is analyzing one to two things from the visual that you think are relevant. <clears throat> The carefree nature and danger involved in the image may position the parental audience to consider the recklessness of youth in such environments and therefore question the viability of pill testing in mitigating risk to young people's health. As such, this exacerbated concern may promote a dissociation from the government's policy and its purported harm minimization, thereby generating support against it. Moreover, this is strengthened by the use of, this is getting very long, but this is indicating that there would be another technique from the visual that this is aiming to um, <clears throat> analyze. Now, the second one shows you that the image is trying to have its own paragraph of analysis and it's almost like a uh, its own argument, which is not the case. You must link within link visual analysis within the appropriate body paragraph that you think the visual is part of the argument for, okay? So this is exactly what I described. First, you need to find a link between the written and visual material. So there is, there should be a PLT that you can discuss and analyze, and the idea within that PLT relates closely to your visual. So immediately after that analysis, you're gonna go on and say, um, there is also an embedded image of blah, 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 and start analyzing that visual. So these are the steps describing what the visual is literally depicting. If you find that confusing, just consider foreground, what you see at the front, central element, and background. If any of those or more than one of those is relevant, that's exactly what you should be describing in this short little sentence. And then you analyze that symbolic meaning of the visual, completing the what, how, why process of analysis for specific visual elements, one or two maximum. <laughs> and then discuss how it adds to or detracts from the writer's argument. You don't need to do this separately, okay? This can just be part of your analysis, that what, how, why process. Um, but it does need to be made clear. <clears throat> so we're looking at an example here, okay? This is called the Pokey's problem, a deafening silence in the face of untold harm. Okay, so looking at this one, we'll, we'll head into straight the analysis straight away. Feel free to pause and read this yourself. I just don't want to waste that time. But really wanting you to see that the visual, the meaning, it's important to look at it together with the test because that adds more meaning or shifts the meaning into something else. <clears throat> so first of all, the very title has a significant PLT there. A deafening silence in the face of untold harm. This is that dot point analysis I was talking about that it's important to do. So this is an oxymoron, which is a figure of speech with contradictory words. Silence cannot be deafening, so that's how it's an oxymoron. Intended effect is it encourages the audience to consider the oxymoron within the context of the title and the issue it is highlighting. That's not particularly interesting to us, but importantly it shows that uh, the silence to the issue is problematic or un unjust. The fact that there is no government response to the gambling problem. And then the next relevant PLT, my story, like many others, is devastating and life-changing. So this appeals to a majority. 
showing that this issue with gambling is more common in the community than people think. It posits the reader to conceive the grandiosity of the issue, the fact that it's a huge problem. And why? By framing the issue as large, the reaction to address it might be strengthened, or at least we hope that it will. Now here we see a listing of all the, those devastating consequences to the author. The listing helps to evoke sympathy for the author and others like him or her in hopes that they would be more sympathetic to their suffering and the issue and thus be more inclined to heed to the author's solutions. So it's hopefully aiming to mitigate prejudice that people may have against <clears throat> people who gamble. Firstly, by showing that this is a really common issue. And then, of course, by showing that the consequences are devastating. So we should instead have empathy and want to help people rather than judge them for um, being involved in gambling. Okay. Now we see that there has been exclusive language that has been used. The general public reading this will wonder why we persist. The exclusive language helps to separate the general public from the issue, characterizing them as people who do not understand the issue. Um, this aims to encourage the critical reader to acquaint themselves with the issue, seeking to understand the author's perspective and be a little bit more sympathetic. That's quite similar to my analysis prior, right? But we had this chat with you guys previously about how it's important to be selective when you're doing your detailed plans and dot point analysis at first, try to find everything and then analyze everything and then choose what's best so that as you practice this, further and further on, you'll start being able to just do this in your head without having to write it all out and think about it. So a very valuable exercise. <clears throat> okay, moving through. Poker machines are a drug. Of course, they're not actually a drug, so this is a metaphor. Um, <clears throat> this helps to elicit negative connotations of drugs, the harm they cause, and the sheer dependency they create. Why is the author doing this? To really show that uh, there must be a serious response. Why is the government not initiating a serious response to gambling addiction as they do with drugs when the harm gambling causes is just as severe as other addictions if not more the mind-altering effects are devastating <clears throat> it repeats devastating from earlier in the text like not in this paragraph but in a previous paragraph so we could say that this is a bookend or you could just refer to this as negative connotations um, or emo emotive language <clears throat> Again, helps to compound seriousness, sympathy for the author and the response needed. <clears throat> now here, our governments invest untold effort into awareness of life preservation. This is a dichotomy <clears throat> because they invest so much effort into preserving life, but not into gambling. So this helps to compound the severity of the issue and position the reader to consider that the government is not doing enough and want them to uh, provoke more action from government. <clears throat> now, uh, hyperbole is present here, an exaggeration. When you look at the road hole, a drunk, underage, unlicensed driver in a V8 Commodore with bald tires on a wet Friday night is probably safer than a patron sitting at a poker machine for hours on end. So hopefully you can see exactly how that is an exaggeration. That's a really drastic example. This aims to elicit a sense of extreme danger and fear and connote that with gambling. <coughs> Positioning the reader to view gamblers as people that actually need protection. More should be done to advance this effort. Now, token gestures, that's really an attack on government there or, or criticism. They only offer token gestures to mitigate the gambling problem. Um, <clears throat> and financial influence from the industry leaders is another criticism. This is alluding to the fact that there is corruption involved, that there is money to be made from gambling. And this is why <clears throat> the government is not doing enough, because there is more for them to gain if they do nothing alluding to corruption. <clears throat> so now when doing our visual analysis, we found step one for the visual analysis. This is the appropriate part for us to bring in the visual analysis right there. Because it's referring to government, corruption, financial gain, which is exactly what we see in the visual. 
So right after my analysis of financial influence from industry readers, I would start introducing there is an embedded cartoon and what can we see of a person <clears throat> representing government connecting to IV lines of money and revenue, something like that, right? And then choosing those one to two things to analyze. It's quite a few things significant here, but again, this is a process of selection. What I believe is really relevant, obviously the municipality sign on the desk shows contracts that this figure represents government or policy makers, people in authority. And then extremely relevant is the casino revenue drug bag, um, which shows <clears throat> the reason they're not doing anything about it is that corruption and the reason because they have income and lots to gain from the gambling problem. <clears throat> you could analyze that intoxicated expression as well. It's indicating um, a lack of care or concern. You've got that salivating mouth <coughs> and yellowed eyes that show um, not thinking clearly, um, just intoxicated on, you know, the, the thrill of having all of this money and not thinking about the people suffering at all. There's some quite a few things there to think about. So it's a really nice visual to look at. Okay, guys, moving into audiovisual argument analysis, not a super long section here, more of a discussion. Um, as per your new study design, you know, you have to analyze audiovisuals now. However, this will not be on your exam. This can only be part of your SACs because um, on the exam, obviously, you don't have any listening task and you can't listen to audio or watch a visual such as, you know, a TED talk. So um, <clears throat> just be aware that um, you're only doing audiovisual analysis in school and your exam article will still likely be just an article at most, maybe something like a podcast transcript or another transcript of a spoken text. But you'll be analyzing it as a written text because it won't be audiovisual. So first of all, what are your audio materials? <clears throat> so commonly you might be looking at things like a TED talk in school, an excerpt from a podcast, some kind of sound clip or recording of a book or a story or a film, a debate on a topic, a Q&A segment, TV advertisement, could be almost anything. It's any kind of persuasive material that you actually have to view and listen to rather than just read. <clears throat> so audio visual material is a little bit harder to work with because you have to use active listening to decipher the contentions, argument, and PLTs. And if you're not provided with a transcript of your audiovisual, you might actually have to write um, everything down as you're listening. Additionally, you know, you have to analyze vocal techniques and you have to analyze any props or visual elements as well as body language as part of your argument analysis task, not just the PLTs alone. So the strategy that you can undertake in is active listening and note taking. So a little bit, I refer to this as a note form summary. <clears throat> so this means just writing down the key information as soon as you hear it. So quotes, identifying PLTs, the free arguments and contention as well as a plan. But then when you have a complete plan, <clears throat> all of your evidence and arguments is noted down it will be easier to write um, the whole essay on an audio visual. <clears throat> so this is what that could look like. This is just a pretty standard plan, but um, obviously it's really important to have a plan like this that you can just fill in when you've got an audio visual text. Obviously it's too difficult if you don't have a transcript and especially you really need to make sure you're writing down <laughs> your body language, your vocal techniques. So was there stress there? Was there a raised or lowered intonation there, a uh, pause or an extended pause, you need to be writing uh, all of that down. If you won't have unlimited access to the audiovisual text and you know be able to see it and watch it and listen to it as many times as you like, but you actually have a limit, so then unavoidably must go under your PLTs. Now I also say to students, if your text is audiovisual, <clears throat> um, to be reflective of the text type, I would aim for a 50-50 balance in my analysis. So, you know, about 50% should just be my, um, the same PLTs as you would see in a written text. And then the other 50% can be your body language, any visual element that's relevant, or you can see, um, and vocal techniques. <coughs> 
So let's have a look at an example plan of this plan being used. This is in regards to a TED talk from Khan Academy about online learning. <clears throat> so let's say we adopted the plan and this is the quick version of the plan. So argument one was that online interactive learning should become the standard as it experienced significant support and is the preference of most students nowadays. The PLTs we noted down that we want to analyze include statistical evidence, anecdote, repetition, humor, and we see they're all, they've all been quoted. <clears throat> for argument two, online interactive learning is more convenient for both students and teachers or tutors alike. And again, the techniques have been noted down with quotes. <clears throat> for argument three, we noted down that movements to enforce wider use of interactive learning have already begun, but further action has to be taken in order to ensure that these beneficial changes are enforced at a national level. Again, techniques have been noted down with quotes. You can write the contention before you write your arguments, but some students like to write the contention last um, after they know what each argument is. <clears throat> so the contention has been written out as well. Khan contends that traditional models of in-classroom teaching are tedious and less effective. We should consider flipping the traditional classroom script to allow for online and interactive learning. And then, of course, you would apply the what, how, why process of analysis as you usually do. So for the statistical evidence, you have a million students a month using the site, watching on the order of 100 to 200,000 videos a day. This encourages the audience to consider that online interactive learning must be an effective teaching method if it's gained so much traction. So this is our intended effect. And then the why, reinforcing the idea that the methods utilized for learning should reflect modern day preferences of students, teachers, and their families. There is an anecdote that's been analyzed. I was in Boston and I was tutoring my cousins remotely. <clears throat> Again, the how intends to position the audience to feel that Khan is not only a successful business owner, but also an innovative individual who was concerned with the quality of available education methods. Thus, Khan confirms that there were no ulterior motives such as financial gain behind his innovation. So that's analysis of the why. You can have a read through the other ones as well. So it's just your typical analysis, but what were we missing? The actual audiovisual elements. So what can you see in that video is other things you need to be thinking of. <clears throat> Body language, in my opinion, may not be as relevant. I would aim to analyze more vocal techniques. So changes in volume, stress, pace, um, intonation, rising or falling, those things I would pay more attention to, especially because your audiovisual analysis is stronger. Because if you're analyzing, um, an audio technique, um, then inevitably you have to quote where that audio technique was used, such as quote where the stress was placed, and then you have to analyze both of those things. So you're, it's almost like you're combining evidence and you're analyzing two things at once, you know, the PLT that stress was placed on, as well as the actual impact of placing emphatic stress <clears throat> on that, um, on what was said. So that helps to elevate your audiovisual analysis and make it really, really, really high quality. Now, in terms of visual elements, if you do notice something relevant, some of those things could include facial expressions, hand gestures, hand movement while speaking, eye gaze, lack of eye contact or overwhelming eye contact, open or closed body language, use of the space and movement such as walking around and body posture in general. So I've written down some of the general functions for you guys here that you can um, have a read through. But of course, this is just the general idea. Um, but you need to apply it more specifically to that particular person to that specific audiovisual piece of material. <clears throat> now, more importantly, those audio elements that I said are more relevant, potentially more important. So intonation is the rise and fall of voice when speaking. So rising intonation is what I did just now. And Falling intonation you usually use when you end a sentence, also did just now, okay? So using that appropriate meta language, you should be able to identify those in a text. <laughs> Volume, obviously louder or quieter. Pace, speaking quicker or slower. Usually a faster pace helps to create this frantic feeling or frustrated feeling, and that slower pace can place a lot of emphasis on an idea. Pausing, 
include short pauses and long pauses. Stress, we know that's when we place emphasis on a certain word or syllable. <laughs> and tone, but the difference in an audiovisual is you can actually hear the tone. <clears throat> okay, looking at an exemplar audiovisual analysis, so if you'd like, you can obviously search this video up on YouTube. This is only from a couple of months ago. Kate Middleton is a member of the royal family. The issue, this is kind of like a, this is from the Today News, and they're kind of like a news talk, a little bit trashy. They're just talking about the speculation surrounding Kate Middleton's health. She had a surgery. She was very secretive about it. Now she's been spotted in public for the first time. So they're wondering what's been going on. So let's have a look at this audiovisual analysis. The Today Show's guest, Russell Myers, suggested the public should respect Kate Middleton's privacy and support her recovery rather than seeking out information about her condition. So as per usual, you should write your normal topic sentence for presenting the argument. Um, in this case, obviously, this is just a one body paragraph theme. So this is almost like a contention rather than just a singular argument. OK, notice what's different is like we've mentioned where this is coming from the Today Show. And um, there's actually more than one speaker. There's the host and then there's the guest. But the guest talks for the majority of the time. So he's being attributed as the author, pretty much, of, of this. We're not saying author, but we're referring to him primarily throughout the piece and even in the topic sentence as well, to help make that clear. The host of the Today Show opened the conversation by stating that there's been so much speculation, so many theories surrounding Kate Middleton's health, so we've completed the what. This exaggeration, naming the PLT, serves the function of entertaining viewers of the show and getting them engaged in the issue by emphasizing the controversy surrounding her condition. So we're analyzing this function of entertainment, and you can see that that's a little bit different than um, an analysis we'd expect just from a usual article. So you can see that there's some other things you can do and ideas you can come up with, aud with audio visuals, even just when considering their form um, and the type of audio visual. There's an analysis here of a visual element. Background video footage is also utilized to display Kate smiling and in good health, contrasting this with footage of the hospital where she undertook her surgery, which contributes to audience's sense of worry and speculation as to her current condition. So you've got an example of the visual analysis here, basically in that video, if you go and watch it, um, it's a big contrast, footage of her happy and smiling and then footage of the hospital where she had the surgery. The show's guest, Russell Myers, provides his opinion in response to the issue by raising a rhetorical question. Why haven't we seen Kate then? Contradicting himself by suggesting that she was seen on Monday, resting and recuperating. Now, this has been underlined because there is an emphatic stress place here too. So we have a vocal technique. Notice uh, what I mentioned. Vocal techniques are best to analyze in an audiovisual because it's two birds with one stone, right? We uh, identified that there's a stress and we've identified that there's a rhetorical question too and we analyze both of those. So this is raised to highlight the importance of Kate being able to maintain her privacy while she's recovering, hoping to alert the public to the notion that they've been excessively interested in her activities and public appearances despite her taking some needed time to herself. And this continues, so the rhetorical question was analyzed and now the stress is being analyzed. The emphatic stress placed on she was seen highlights that Kate is indeed alive and well, and that there's no need for these rumors and speculation. Then there's more analysis of more written elements, which you can have a read through. And there's another one here. Throughout his appearance, Myers also maintains a sense of neutrality by maintaining composed, unchanging facial expressions, as well as minimal hand gestures, allowing for emphasis to be placed on his message rather than the dramatics of the new show. This is where it's kind of relating to the fact that he's really aiming to uh, appear credible and that he's also concerned about Kate's safety and privacy and uh, reinforcing this message that she should be left alone and there shouldn't be any rumors. And so you can have a read through the rest of this, but hopefully this gives you a great example of what an audiovisual analysis paragraph could look like. And now moving on to our last section, which is combined both text response and creating text as well. So on this um, 
the slide, obviously you can see a variety of different um, essay prompts. So basically this is just indicating step one, pick an essay prompt. We're just doing a short little text response revision. There will be more focus of it in, in the next uh, ATAR notes lecture series on text response again, but we're just doing a quick uh, one that's going to include basically just, just planning for um, a whole essay and talking through that process. <clears throat> And there's more prompts on this one. Okay, so the prompt we've picked, let's just imagine for the sake of a task was Wuthering Heights is a novel that revels in chaos and turbulence discuss. And as with any essay, we know we need a counter argument for any text response essay, but discuss just helps to indicate that one of our arguments must be a counter argument, one of our body paragraphs. <clears throat> So step one, and I want you to never skip this step because every single year on the examiner's reports, the VCA examiners complain that students did not address all of the key words through their arguments in their essay, a lot of students, and that their marks suffered because obviously you obtain a holistic mark for each essay in English based on the overall quality of the response. If anything in the prompt is, has not been addressed, you know, you, it's not possible to score any sort of high marks. So we found the key words were revels, chaos, and turbulence. Revels referring to celebrates, chaos, disorder, and confusion, and turbulence is instability. If there are, if there are difficult words, you know, this is why you really want to bring in your dictionary into an exam so you can define any tricky words. But similarly, terms that appear together and sound slightly sim similar, they generally still have slightly different connotations and they cannot be conflated and treated as the same term with the same meaning. So I would aim to have a body paragraph, an argument about chaos and one about turbulence as well because instability versus disorder are two completely different ideas. And this is how assessors try to differentiate students because the high scoring students won't miss this, we'll understand that these are two separate ideas, but the low scoring students might conflate chaos and turbulence, treat them as the same thing, and all of their arguments about are, are about chaos. There's no turbulence or instability really addressed separately. <clears throat> now we need to decide on our opinion. So, you know, you'd be considering, do you agree that this is a novel that revels in chaos and turbulence? We're thinking not really, so we're trying to find ways to challenge the prompt. So we're thinking, does it celebrate the chaos? Are there times where disturbance is commiserated? And are there moments where the novel is not chaotic or turbulent? So choose your main perspective and uh, come up with a counter argument as well. <clears throat> so we know you cannot completely agree or completely disagree with an essay prompt because you must have a counter argument. You cannot be neutral as well because then you don't have any opinion that you're providing. So you need to decide along the lines of more, do you disagree more or do you agree more? I've just run out of water guys and my mouth is getting pretty dry from all of this talking. So I will be right back. I'm just gonna get some water. I'm not able to pause the recording. So feel, feel free to skip a little bit until I come back.
Okay, there we go. Um, okay, so continue on. So after this, we need to plan our arguments. Three to four points. Generally, I would say just aim for three, right? It's better to have free body paragraphs, free arguments, but more detail to them than to have way too many arguments than you need, but less detail. So don't go for four body paragraphs. But at least one of them must be a counter argument challenging the pot. So this on the exam, you know, you should only spend like five minutes max planning an essay because you only have 60 minutes in total for each task. So you need to get really adept at do, doing detailed plans now so that you can actually not write complete topic sentences, but have the skill to just use these kind of like dot points with some evidence underneath for your plan and then turn them into proper topic sentences when you're actually just already writing the essay when you get to that point. So at first we jot down dot points, but for the sake of imagining that this is a detailed plan, we will turn them into proper topic sentences. I just would not do that on the exam so as to not waste a bunch of time. I would keep my um, ideas as dot points and then turn them into topic sentences. <laughs> so some of those ideas for our arguments were that Catherine and Heathcliff's love is chaotic, that even harmless or moral characters can be violent and turbulent, that supernatural elements create turbulence, and that chaos goes away at the end of the book because of ca the characters Cavi and Hareton. So we're thinking more character-based at this stage. But now we need to flesh out our dot points into topic sentences so that they are relevant to the prompt. They must each of them must be relevant to some kind of key word, okay? that they are an argument and not a statement that the assessor reads them and thinks, so what? Tell, uh, not, not thinking so what, but thinking, okay, I see the argument, the idea here, so tell me how this is seen in the text. And so that they're ideas based and not <coughs> characters based. In general, we, we shouldn't see character names in a topic sentence. So for the first one, Catherine Heathcliff's love is chaotic. We're fleshing it out. So the author, Bronte, demonstrates how love and hate can be inextricably intertwined, making it difficult for readers to ascertain between the two. And now that's been turned into a lovely argument with a concrete idea there that we can we can clearly see. Even harmless or more characters can be violent and turbulent. So this is addressing the other keyword, turbulence. And again, turn it into a proper topic sentence, mentioning the author's name, using a writer does word, and <clears throat> including at least one or two clear definitive ideas that we have to prove. So in the previous one, that was love and hate are intertwined. That's the idea we're trying to prove. Bronte's characters subvert conventional boundaries of good and evil, thus revealing how there can be no definitive sense of morality. So our statement or idea contained within this is that uh, no person is good or bad. They're a mix of both. So we can see again, this is a proper argument, a proper topic sentence that <clears throat> makes makes me ask, okay, tell me how, provide some evidence for that. The reason I'm breaking this down in so much detail is because a lot of students really struggle with topic sentences and continue to struggle. So looking at these good examples um, is, is important and talking through what is an appropriate topic sentence versus what is not. <laughs> for ghost great turbulence, the argument could be the fantastic occurrences of the novel demonstrate how the boundaries between real and unreal are blurred. Um, so again, that's referring more so to, to the chaos idea. And chaos goes away at the end of the book because of Kate, Kathy, and Hareton. We can see clearly that this is a counter argument and it also challenges the word revels in that way as well. Nonetheless, Bronte promises her readers with a sense of harmony through the careful blend of characters of her future generation more hope comes into the text and the chaos and turbulence is gone so the book isn't just reveling in chaos and turbulence so we can see how that properly shows a counter argument and the thing we have to prove according to our topic sentence is that there's this sense of harmony created by the new characters coming in at the end of the book it's easier to form your contention that's going to go in your essay introduction after you formulated all of your topic sentences. Because obviously the contention 
has to cover not only your main position with regards to the prompt, but your main reason for that position as well. Okay. So thus, Bronte ultimately suggests that despite the chaos and turbulence of the past, order can still be restored to ensure love prevails. Why is this a really good contention? Because it includes both the main argument, our main position, as well as the counter argument as well, which is crucial for a, for a strong contention. I would say expanding on your contention is a great strategy as well. I'd like to dedicate a separate sentence to both my main opinion, so expanding upon these ideas of chaos and turbulence, and then a separate sentence on my counter argument as well for a strong, really strong contention to go in my intro. Now, the best next step for our essay planning is to make note of all of the specific quotes and evidence you're aiming to include under each paragraph and add analysis of them as well. So this should be a dot point analysis. Don't just waste a bunch of time um, analyzing them. So let's look for the love and hate can be an inextricably intertwined argument. We've noted some of the evidence that we want to use. And now we include a little bit of analysis. I'm Heathcliff, quote, this is where Bronte reveals that they construct identities in terms of each other. Kathy describes the union as a little visible delight, but necessary, one that degrades her. That's already been embedded nicely to go into a, a sentence of the essay. This demonstrates how their relationship is manifested by the need or reliance on each other as opposed to love. Because she doesn't actually feel good about it. It degrades her, little delight. And then where Hareton tells Kathy she's his murderer, and Kathy tells him, you have killed me. This is where Bronte, the author, elucidates how lovers are gripped by romantic rivalry that is almost sadistic. So this quote in particular extremely well demonstrates relevance to our topic sentence because all of our evidence and analysis has to be relevant to the key words in the prompt and to our argument. This idea that love and hate are intertwined shows it very well. And then remembering that, you know, if you're just working with a novel, you still must find some kind of language devices to analyze. So things like metaphors or symbols. If you're working with a different text type, like a play, play specific techniques. If you're working with a film, film techniques must be used. <clears throat> so um, with films in particular, I always say like it's a 50-50 split between film techniques and just written uh, evidence quotes. Um, with plays and novels, not so much. I would just aim to have at least one sort of language device in each body paragraph as one of my pieces of evidence. Um, and with plays, you know that you've got things like stage directions and props that uh, provide um, those elements that might be relevant on, on top of symbols and metaphors, all of, this, all of the same that you find in a novel. So we found a couple of techniques we want to put in this paragraph. Um, Kathy's ghost haunts Heathcliff. This represents this is a symbol, the transcendent nature of love. You know, it's even after death because she has a willingness to torment him after death. Again, really relevant to our topic sentence and the idea of chaos. Heathcliff and Kathy's ghost roaming of moors shows a metaphorical rejection of heaven, that there's no good... Uh, uh, good or evil. It's a mix between the two. And then we see some views and values analysis here. So at least two times per body paragraph, you must go on to have an extended detailed analysis in your text response essay if you want to score high marks. So views and values analysis, obviously analysis of the author's views and values. Uh, we introduce properly by using the author's last name as well as a some kind of writer does verb or authorial intent verb um, and then go into detail about what the author is is saying about the world of the text or the world in general or some kind of views and values okay aim is at least two times per paragraph because the bulk of um, your marks for a text response essay lies in actually having complex analysis so uh, we're doing the extended analysis for the symbol of Kathy's ghost haunting Heathcliff. And our views and values analysis here uh, is that Bronte espouses how the finiteness of human nature, 
the fact that life, you know, ends can result in yearning for an eternal reality where people can become their complete selves. So that would be an example of reason values analysis. Okay, and then uh, the next part of planning is stating what the author uh, has as their ultimate view in terms of your arguments and must be relevant to the prompt. <clears throat> so this is referring to your concluding sentences because your concluding sentences, the last sentence of each body paragraph, must show the ultimate view in terms of your topic sentence of the author. It's a views and values as well to close, but it must be in relation to your topic sentence. Remembering to, you know, April's lecture, the topic sentence and the concluding sentence are connected. The closing concluding sentence is like a views and values analysis of the topic sentence. That's the best way to explain it. Um, so if our argument was Bronte demonstrates how love and hate can be inextricably intertwined, making it difficult for readers to ascertain between the two, our concluding sentence may be Bronte thus conveys that an inability to look beyond one's own needs and feelings is what can characterize romantic relationships as tumultuous and harmful. Tumult tumultuous is just a synonym for chaos. That really shows to you your concluding sentence must be irrelevant to the prompt. So I can't write a concluding sentence just about relationships alone or the concept of love and hate. My concluding sentence must somehow connect to the idea that how and why Bronte thinks love can be chaotic or turbulent. So that would be mean like feelings never stay the same, feelings change, people change type of thing. But we know we're not using this um, idea for relationships with this plan, we used it for a different idea. That's okay, another example. <laughs> Bronte's characters subvert con conventional boundaries of good and evil, thus revealing how there can be no definitive sense of morality. And a concluding sentence may be, through demonstrating that even the most innocuous characters, innocent characters, um, as engaging in unethical behavior, not only does Bronte undermine Victorian England's rigid moral code, but also unveil how violent environment can ferment and poison a community's life. So this is showing um, more with regards to chaos. And what's really great about this views and values concluding sentence is that it links back to context for which you also get some marks. So you need to make sure you're doing this every once in a while. And there's another one as well. You can have a look and another one. Another thing to potentially plan is your conclusion. To help you draft it, look at your intro, your contention, because obviously you summarize that as well as the first part, first part of your conclusion. And then revisit your concluding sentences for each paragraph and consolidate them further. Because the expectation with your conclusion is not that you repeat your contention the way you phrase it in your intro, but that you are able to state it in different words and expand and have new things and more complex things to say with regards to the prompt and, and the contention of your essay than you had in your intro or throughout your body progress. And then the second part should be ending on a really strong, impactful views and value statement, as with any other paragraph. The last sentence of your intro, the last sentence of each body paragraph, and the last sentence of your conclusion should all be views and value statements. So looking at this example, in essence, Bronte provides readers with a world that is plagued by ambiguity. The boundaries between love and hate, good and evil, and the real and unreal are blurred, and the subversion of such boundaries encompass the chaos and turbulence of wuthering heights. So we see a beautiful expanded um, <coughs> contention here, and it's referring specifically to some of what the arguments or topic sentences were about. Love and hate, good and evil, real and unreal. This is why you look at your body paragraphs as well when um, you're writing your conclusion. It is only the love of the following generation that possesses a promise of certainty and allows for the novel to reach emotional completion. So referring to the counter argument and then our views and values. In consequence, Bronte extols feeling and living in moderation and respecting the humanity of others to allow for a more harmonious and peaceful life. So her ultimate message really impactful bit of a mic drop statement that you want to end your assessor will your conclusion will really stand out to your assessor because it's the last thing they'll read so very important to make that as impactful as possible <laughs> so 
So our last section is our creating text section section, and we won't spend a super long amount of time on this because um, the last two ATAR notes lectures spent heaps of time on this. Um, remember that this time around as well, if you didn't attend the creating text separate lectures for each framework last time, you should really register and make sure you attend because that's framework specific and really, really valuable. Um, otherwise, you know, explaining it in a really general way because everyone is doing one of the four different frameworks is a bit too general. So I highly recommend those um, specific sessions. Um, they're also run by me as well. Similarly, um, as we've done previously, looking at the criteria, what do you need to be able to do? You're obviously crafting a text. This is a creative, but you must show that you're developing meaningful ideas. So you must have a complex purpose, a complex message behind your piece. It must be incorporating your framework adequately. And we're going to revise some of the writing ideas that you could have. You must be creating a purposeful text for a specific context and audience. So context and audience must be really clear from your piece. You must be experimenting with vocabulary and text structures. So abiding by the genre conventions of the text type that you've chosen to write in. Example, if I'm writing a blog post, it should be littered with persuasive language techniques. If I'm writing a short story, imagery, metaphors, um, the symbols, some kind of motive or recurring motive, things like that. Um, there should be a clear, sustained and individual voice. So a consistent tone and style of writing throughout. Um, and the last one is more referring to your writing skill. So just quickly chatting through and some of these things that I've already mentioned, a clear and stated purpose that should be complex. This message must be in relation to your framework. So if you're writing about country, the message, the overall ultimate message of your piece should be something with regards to country. It cannot be about something else or a different theme. Um, and really, you should be doing a lot of planning. So at this stage, obviously, you're not going to do creating text until the exam. So sit down, practice, look at the sample exam Vika has posted, the section for your framework, and try to do plans for all of the four prompts for your framework and actually try to write a, a couple of pieces at this stage just to make sure you don't lose that skill. Reading your old work is really good for this um, area of study as well. <clears throat> Now, what else we said you need to define, uh, really uh, make sure you plan and you're doing. Um, your own authorial intent must be clear in your piece. Now you're the author. So make it as complex as possible. Make sure that you're making specific choices, specific language choices as well, to target uh, your target audience, because you get some marks for audience also. Look at your mentor text ultimately to help you understand how this can be done because each of the mentor texts on the study design super effect effectively target audiences through their language have a super clear context uh and and all of that is <coughs> an expectation for you as well if you want to score those uh top marks in this area of study on the exam okay so let's just redefine our frameworks um writing about country is your explorations of place and belonging now, for some writing ideas, you know, go go to the creating text lecture for a lot of detail about this. But just generally, there's still a lot you can write about physical land and country, local and international travel, loss of country, dispossession, migration, remembering country, nostalgia, indigenous people's connections to, to, to land and country. Um, and even modern concepts like climate change and the changing landscape or futuristic concepts like an imagined country um, traveling to a non-existent place, making up your own country, basically. <clears throat> Writing about protest is very much more of a narrow concept. You need to be writing specifically about uh, protest, whether that's group or protest or individual. So it could be internalized. And you could even be protesting against yourself, like you could have an issue with yourself and have a form of internal protest. So I guess that brings in some kind of new idea for you to potentially think about. So some ideas, you can write about what it means to protest, the values of protest, the outcomes, personal stories of protest, struggle and war. 
you can write about different forms of protest as well. Peaceful protest or violent forms of protest, implicit, subtle or explicit forms of protest as well. Um, if you like history, if you like reading up on facts and things like that, it might be a wonderful idea to read up on a specific protest that you're interested in or a specific figure known for a protest. You could create a character that is a lot like them, or you could even write about them. And it can even be an informative or a persuasive piece about uh, a person that actually does exist or a protest that does exist. Or you can use it as a basis to create your own person or idea for protest or something like that. Writing about personal journey. So opposite to protest, this is the most broad framework that you have the most freedom and things to write about. So these can be explorations of life or biographical explorations. It could be an autobiography, a person reflecting on key moments of their life. Um, <clears throat> or it could be telling stories, it could be talking about someone's life path, life journey, um, personal milestones, key events in their life. So this is actually really easy to write about yourself with this framework. Or you could even explore ideas through the eyes of others. <clears throat> Similarly to country, migration and stories of movement and disruption are also suitable to write about under this framework. Now, writing about play um, is not just limited to childhood play. Yes, this is a more narrow framework again, but not as not as narrow as protest probably. So childhood play is 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 definitely the key around this framework, and that will definitely be on the exam, but there are more ideas. So it includes all of your hobbies. So things like games, sport, acting, um, anything relating to imagination. So things like reading books, um, playing music, language, images, cultural aspects even, and even the idea of <clears throat> uh, having downtime and time to play, how that shifts as an adult. So, you know, relaxation, what you do with your free time, how a lack of work-life balance compromises play. So there's so many different things you can really write about here. Um, and even things like concepts like rule breaking. So there are so many ideas that really come under it. Just the problem is you need to make sure those ideas um, are likely to come up as prompts on your exam. So have a look at that sample exam and see, you know, if you have something a bit more niche, like reading books that you want to use for your um, uh, piece about play, it's not likely going to come up as a prompt for you. So need to need to make sure. Um, it's not too niche, even though it does apply to the framework. <clears throat> now, remembering that purpose, audience and context, and I think I already mentioned this before, so I won't read this again, but they're the foundation of your writing and you're getting marks for including these elements. So um, decide on your message with regards to your framework and appropriate audience and what language choices you will make in order to target them and establish a clear context in your piece. Now, you're also required to choose one or according to VCA or more of these purposes, but obviously it's getting too convoluted and you're making it harder for yourself if you choose one more than one. So just choose one of these. Are you trying to express such as expressing feelings and experiences? Are you trying to explain? So this is more suitable for uh, informative or persuasive pieces of writing. Um, so really break down a concept or explain cause and effect, for instance. Are you trying to reflect? This would be wonderful, for example, for a biographical piece about personal journeys <clears throat> or writing a memoir or um, and uh, even maybe something like an interview with someone talking about multiple aspects of their life. Or are you trying to argue? So this is specifically for your persuasive writing, blog posts, um article um you <clears throat> might be you know some kind of podcast or something like that um that you might be choosing to argue so all of these are different but key to the to understand looking towards the exam is that you're expected to clearly show and you won't be writing a reflective commentary on the exam that's not part of it so 
it must be clear from your writing which one of these four were you trying to achieve or more than one if, if you do want to do more than one um i won't explain this but you in, in that much detail but context means um your creative piece should clearly indicate some sort of context it might be modern but it can be just as broad as that so is your context you know post covid is your context sometime in the future is your context the backdrop of some kind of social or political issue a clear political issue is it the context of global warming um establish a really clear context in your piece either way and then audience don't choose general Australian public. I know this is annoying, but you really need to try through your writing to target some very specific groups, such as are you targeting young people versus all older groups of people or specific social group in society or people affected by something specific, but you need to make that clear. That is an expectation of um, the assessment as well. <clears throat> so make sure it's not so general that it's just the general public. Okay, looking at a couple of examples I've attached, guys. I don't think we'll read the super long pieces because um, you've you've heard me read a lot of things today and it's also likely quite boring for you. But you remember when I said that you can download the slides under resources. I just thought it really, really, really important for you to be able to um, have a couple of resources attached so you can actually read it and have some student pieces to look at. But the first thing we'll look at is an, is an example of a prompt with regards to play and then planning it and actually writing it, writing some pieces up. So we'll go through the plans, but the pieces are there for you to read, have a think, they're actual student pieces, have a think about what's good or bad about each piece, okay? So first one with regards to play, we see this one is about um, travel, okay? So a key part of scoring good marks is appropriately applying your prompt. So you must write this piece about travel um, <clears throat> of some kind, okay? It's quite narrow. So in this plan, you can do a dot point, point like this, plan like this, just making sure you're covering all of the key elements that you need to tick off on the rubric. <clears throat> so the text type is going to be a blog post. The purpose or the message is going to be that Travel can act as a form of play. So nice, we're making sure our message is in relation to the framework specifically. Because it provides opportunities to unwind, explore different cult cultures and places, and expand our understanding of the world. And we're also trying to show that there are different forms of travel that people can consider. It's not necessarily international, but it can be in the form of local and interstate travel as well. So that's what the piece will more center around. The specific audience that's been chosen is young adults, specifically uni students or future uni students, considering taking a gap year to travel. So notice how nice and specific this audience should be. Context is modern, obviously the setting of taking a gap year, and the persona is going to be a uni student that has done a gap year. So all very um, relevant and thought out. Now you could do a dot point plan like this to help you actually write. So structure your writing it is much easier to write and much easier to work with the time limit if you just dot point plan the order of everything and the ideas that you want to present and state and analyze and develop further. So for body paragraphs, we might start with a hook. So for instance, are you thinking of traveling or taking a gap year to travel? Something along those lines, a bit of a hook because this is a blog post. And then present some of the benefits of travel and make more connections to the play framework, talking about how it's important for relaxation, recovery, rejuvenation. Then different forms of travel would be introduced in this blog post. The fact that it's accessible, it doesn't have to be international. It can be in Australia as well. Anecdotal evidence about how the persona had no money but still wanted to travel, spent the year traveling Australia, living and driving around in a van, making more of a personal connection to the persona and helping to create some language choices, targeting the audience of people considering doing a gap year then engaging in fun aspects of their travel. So we're gonna to try to add some humor into this piece to make it more engaging. And humor specifically helps to apply the framework of play as well, because a couple of your mentor or texts use humor or play with language, and that helps to apply the framework as well. So some stories about how the van broke down in the middle of nowhere, 
um, cultural shocks, uh, comparing impressions of major cities and which ones they find better and why, as some examples. Then, specifically, it's going to go to talk to a uni student about why they should consider taking a gap year. So audience-specific ideas will be used here, such as burnout, realizing that after grad, if you work full time, you will never be able to have these experiences, and then some more ideas specifically relating to play there. So we can see that plan's been written now. <laughs> okay, so we have another one. Let's just look at the plan, and the piece is actually here for you to read. Not perfect, but it's interesting, and it's applying the framework um, really correctly, really well. Um, so this is showing a family with their uh, child. For this piece, the decision title, Worlds Within Us, of course, on the exam, you'll have a title provided to you. The idea is to write a blog post about how important it is for people to unite with their families and express themselves truly. Perspective of a middle-aged male that was a workaholic all of his life, so had no play in his life, no play in his life, until he met his wife. She opened up his shell. <clears throat> play was still being taken out of his life by his work company, as they gave him no free time. But he quit his job for having a kid, as he needed family time. So then, play is in his life. He's having fun. He's spending that time with family. And the overall message is that there's multiple paths to life, and that different worlds can be explored. So don't shut yourself off to let play be there in your life so it's quite a nice um student piece uses again a lot of like humor and sarcasm makes really good use of a persona for this uh office worker persona still applies the prompt because it's got this family um happening and um incorporates the framework of play really well so have a read now here we have this is from the sample exam from bika a personal journeys example this image shows a person going off their set path and wandering off into the distance somewhere far away all by themselves, which looks risky. <clears throat> like, I really like the start of this one in particular. So it just aimed to create a point of view vignette. This is a really interesting idea if you haven't tried it, of a person's life and how their path changes. They go from doing one thing for their life, and this is a a person working in finance, just making a bunch of money, they make this step, they realize that it's not for them, and they quit, and they change their whole life, even though they're old, to become um, involved in um, a charity organization. So this applies the prompt beautifully and has a meaningful message about personal journeys, you know, do something for fulfilling for yourself with your life. If you're not fulfilled with what you're doing, you should not be afraid to change course, and it's important for your happiness. Um, I also really like how the initial paragraph adopts the language of uh, a child very well and um, talks about all, all the different jobs and career pathways that this kid is interested in in a really funny way. Um, so feel free to have a look. <laughs> okay, and that's all for crafting text. Overall, guys, I um, hope you, you're getting a lot out of today's session. You'll take a read of those additional pieces I've attached for you as well. Um, just remembering um, that, you know, there are some great ideas that I've brought up today. At this stage of the year, try to write an essay every week focusing on a different area of study. So argument analysis, text response, and creating text. Practice writing under time conditions. If you struggle with that, initially try typing your essays with the same 60 minute time limit and then switch to handwriting with that same time limit when you get a little bit better at that. Um, and if you can't be bothered writing essays, making notes on your text response text, so quote collections that are organized by themes and characters with dot point analysis is a great alternative. And writing dot point analyses, such as with the what, how, why process that we looked at, is another great alternative and additional thing that you can do. I hope you've really enjoyed today. Don't remember that. Um, You've got still a lot of time, but now is the time to start. So don't procrastinate if you want a high score in English. Um, and best of luck for the rest of the year. Um, and best of luck with English. And thank you for watching, everyone. Bye.